good afternoon, uh, or good afternoon Moscow time. We should be in Moscow. Um, it's good morning from uh, British Virgin Islands, uh, and uh, good evening if you're in the Far East. Um, this is the 12th annual virtual conference uh, of the ABA in association with the Russian Arbitration Association. And today we're going to have um, uh, 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 two very distinguished speeches. Uh, Nikolai Perishkin, um, Sergei Petraktov, um, uh, uh, both of whom are eminent practitioners in the um, uh, Moscow legal market. Um, uh, Sergei is the head of uh, Alrud's dispute resolution team uh, and deals with uh, restructuring and insolvency. Uh, he comes highly recommended in chambers uh, and partners uh, as uh, uh, anticipating solutions and being good with clients. Um, Nikolai Purishkin, um, formerly from Freshfields, is at KKP, um, a very well-known uh, 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 trial um, uh, uh, law firm in, in Moscow, described as a raging bull during hearings uh, and sharp and creative. So we're, we're hoping for some raging bull during uh, today's today's um, uh, session on on uh, arbitration and insolvency. Uh, and without further rage. ado, sorry, Nikolai. I, I will limit my rage intentions uh, during today's session. So yes, I hope you hope you leave your rage for Sergey, not not me. Um, I, I, with, without further ado, I'll hand over to um, to Sergey, who will. Um, uh, uh, deal with some elements uh, arising out of the, the Russian law element of, of this talk. Yes, thank you, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you for, for the introduction. Uh, hello to everybody. Uh, yeah, today we'll speak about uh, uh, correlation between uh, arbitration and bankruptcy. Uh, uh, me and Nikolai will cover the issues of uh, uh, Russian law, and uh, Peter uh, will, will cover the issues of BVI and uh, some uh, some uh, uh, some other jurisdiction, jurisdictions uh, uh. I suppose there are some issues with the connection. I think we may have lost Sergey a little bit. Did you hear me? Now, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, the previous, uh, previous slide, please. Yeah. So the situation uh, differs uh, if we are speaking about the bankruptcy of the plaintiff and bankruptcy of the defendant. And the approach uh, of, uh, of Russian courts uh, is different uh, depending on whom uh, bankruptcy we, we have. Uh, I'll speak uh, in more details about uh, these two dif different situations. Uh, but in short words, uh, I would say that the situation with regard to bankruptcy of the plaintiff, in, in, in my view, uh, is more interesting. It is not clear cut as bankruptcy of the defendant. And uh, there, there, there is no much practice uh, of, the, of the Russian uh, courts and especially the Supreme Court. Uh, there, there was a quite, uh, quite a well known uh, case of, uh, of Radio T in 20, 2017. But I would say uh, that this, uh, this case. Uh, did not uh, make the situation um, uh, and the situation uh, clear, uh, and uh, the, the the case law after this uh, precedent of the Supreme Court uh, uh, remained uh, remained the same, and the approach to uh, uh, to enforceability uh, of the arbitration clauses uh, or non enforceability remains uh, the same, like 70 to 30 percent. Uh, as to the bankruptcy of the defendant, uh, from the Russian law perspective, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is crucial which stage of, uh, which stage of bankruptcy uh, we have. Uh, and uh, here you could divide uh, three main situations, three main scenarios. The first one is uh, uh, you have arbitration proceedings and uh, you obtain a award before, uh, uh, before bankruptcy. Uh, uh, or, or even before before supervision uh, procedure, because in Russia in Russian law we have two two main uh, bankruptcy procedures: uh, supervision and uh, uh, and uh, uh, receivership. receivership. Yes, uh, and uh, so the, the second scenario is uh, when you are between uh, supervision and uh, receivership, and the third uh, situation is when the receivership procedure is uh, introduced. Uh, next slide, please. 
so as I said, uh, before introduction of supervision, uh, there, uh, there is no, no impact of uh, uh, bankruptcy on arbitration. It means that if you have, for example, pending arbitration uh, proceedings, uh, you could pursue uh, with these arbitration proceedings. Uh, the situation differs when the supervision is, uh, is introduced. Uh, because uh, as soon as the supervision is introduced, all monetary claims against the, de defend against the defendant, who is the, de uh, the debtor, uh, who is the bankrupt, um, or potentially, potentially bankrupt, uh, they could, could be uh, initiated uh, only in the course of the, uh, of the supervision uh, proceedings. Um, uh, and uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you manage to initiate uh, arbitration proceedings before introduction of supervision, uh, then it means that you could uh, pursue this uh, arbitration, uh, arbitration proceedings. But for you, it is crucial to obtain an award uh, before introduction of receivership, because otherwise you will not be allowed to uh, recognize it in the course of, of, of bankruptcy. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll be speaking uh, afterwards about some legal remedies, how, how to do it, and one of, one of them is, for example, a partial uh, final award. So, uh, so in short words, if you uh, have uh, arbitration proceedings before introduction of uh, supervision, uh, it is recommended for you to have an award uh, before introduction of receivership, so before declaring the, the debtor uh, bankrupt. Because as soon as uh, the uh, receivership uh, proceedings are initiated, and the debtor is declared bankrupt, it means that uh, tribunal uh, must terminate uh, the arbitration and all claims should go to, to the state court. Uh, and of course, it is, a, it is, uh, it is re relevant uh, when uh, you as the creator uh, uh, would, would like to use your uh, rights uh, uh, in the course of Russian bankruptcy proceedings. And I think, the, I think Nikolai will, will touch this situation uh, when, for example, you have the assets of the debtor uh, somewhere abroad, not in Russia, and uh, I think it's it's up to to, to the creator uh, whether to uh, whether to to go into Russian bankruptcy uh, and to uh, realize all its rights as a creator in the Russian bankruptcy, or maybe there are some assets abroad. And uh, here the situation is quite tricky for the other creators and for the bankruptcy receiver uh, because unfortunately this uh, this situation is not. Uh, is not that much regulated by, by Russian law. And just because um, we do not have uh, transnational, uh, trans, the transnational bankruptcy uh, provisions in, in Russian bankruptcy codes, and uh, just because Russia is not a party to, the, uh, to, to any bankruptcy, uh, bankruptcy, law, uh, bankruptcy law, law treaty. Um, can I, so, can I yeah. just jump in there, actually, Sergei? Because your, yeah. your, your, your graph, um, actually is, is, is a very useful way of demonstrating some of the differences in, in the common law world. So if, if you look at your first point, which is filing of the bankruptcy petition, yeah. and you say there's no impact on the arbitration. Um, now this is where there's a sort of a slight tension between bankruptcy lawyers and arbitration lawyers. And in, and in the common law world, there, there certainly is um, uh, uh, a, um, a very pro-arbitration approach so, so for example, suppose you have a company which um, issues, it has a debt, um, the debt is owed by an English company or a BVI company, and they um, issue winding up proceedings in the English courts or in the BVI courts. Um, uh, the, the debtor, even if the debt seems obviously due and owing, if there's been an obvious defense, an obvious default on, on the debt, sorry, that the debtor company is entitled to say at that stage, but there's an arbitration agreement. You, the court, shouldn't determine whether or not um, the company is insolvent or not, or whether this debt is due or own or not, because there is an arbitration clause. Um, and certainly in, a, in an English case called Salford Estates, um, uh, the, the, the pro-arbitration approach was that ir irrespective of the merits, uh, if there is a defendant company saying, I dispute this debt, it then has to go off to arbitration to be resolved. Um, now, that can cause frustration amongst bankruptcy lawyers and certainly amongst the 
the the claimant's company that says well it's obvious he hasn't paid his debt so i've got this debt instrument he, he hasn't paid his installments he raises some spurious dispute relies on the on the arbitration clause and then gets the winding up petition dismissed or stayed um and and certainly in the in 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 the bvi um there had been um uh, the Salford estates approach hadn't initially been followed so c-mobile is one of the cases um in the court of appeal where they say well the 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 yes we are pro arbitration but equally if it is uh not defended on bona fide grounds on 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 good faith grounds and there's there's no evidence of a of a, of a substantive defense then because the bankruptcy procedure, the liquidation procedure, we'd, we'd refer to it in BVI, is a collective process. Uh, it's for the benefit of all creditors. So they're not adjudicating on the debt. They're saying that this party cannot pay and that it's for the benefit of all creditors that the company be, be wound up. Um, now, there's been, a, there's been a slight development of, in the last two months, really, in, in the BVI. And there are two cases called Lennox and Fair Cheerful, um, for participants, I've got a, a, a note which which I can circulate afterwards if you send me an email, um, uh, which which sets out uh, a, a, the, the more English approach, namely, as soon as a party simply raises the fact that it disputes the debt without even setting forward any any grounds, simply we dispute the debt, um, but then relies on the arbitration clause, then that would be sufficient, um, certainly on on a couple of recent first instance decisions to to knock out the the bankruptcy provision. Actually, here in Russia, uh, we have a choice for the creditor who uh, may choose whether he want to proceed in arbitration during the uh, supervision proceeding or prior to the reduction of supervision proceeding, or uh, whether he is going to join insolvency. So, actually, it's a kind of uh, topic which I uh, am going to discuss. Sergei, should we discuss anything on this slide at the moment, or should I go to? Yeah, frankly, I finished, so uh, the floor, floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. So the next slide, yeah, this slide is fine. So generally, in Russia, the creditor could choose whether he want to continue with arbitration or whether he's going to join us insolvency as a creditor and benefit from all the rights, rights uh, which uh, are given to the creditors. Uh, I believe that this choice is strongly depend from uh, another choice, whether the creditor is going to get recovery from the Russian assets of the debtor within the scope of the Russian insolvency case, or uh, whether the creditor is going to just get an award to enforce it outside of Russia and uh, to get satisfaction on the basis of uh, assets of the debtor located outside of Russia. Of course, at the beginning of the insolvency proceedings, uh, usually creditors don't have uh, a particular idea about uh, the way to proceed with their claim and they need some additional time to collect information about other creditors of the debtor or uh, to collect information about assets of the debtor located in Russia or abroad. So uh, there are main factors affecting the choice uh, is uh, firstly uh, location of debtor assets and uh, amount uh, and composition of other creditors' claim. If you see that there are a lot of creditors that they have a big amount of claim in Russia, and uh, there are no substantial assets of the Russian debtor in Russia, then most probably you will try to get an arbitral award to skip. You will skip Russian uh, insolvency case because there is nothing to get in Russia, and you try to get satisfaction outside. Uh, however, there are some other uh, factors affecting this choice. For example, uh, if uh, you are going to want to participate in the first creditors meeting in the Russian insolvency case, then of course you have to skip your arbitration, file a motion to suspend or terminate arbitration proceeding and then join uh, the Russian insolvency case. If you are participating in a uh, first creditors meeting, then you, can, you could uh, vote for, for example, appointment of a particular receiver for choose of the next stage of bankruptcy, etc. Et so, uh, in such a case, you would affect the further, further way of the insolvency case in Russia. Another factor affecting this choice is the complexity of the case. Usually, Russian judges are not quite sophisticated in a complex 
economic relations and complex agreement, especially uh, agreements concluded at a foreign, I mean, non rational level. So, in such a case, it's uh, better to get an arbitral award first, uh, for example, during the supervision, and to present this award to the Russian state court in the next uh, stage during the receivership. In such a case, uh, experienced uh, arbitrators will consider your case of merits and uh, as an ideal, the Russian court would just check it on the very, very basic breach of uh, the convention. However, in practice, I'll uh, say the Russian court just tend to reconsider uh, arbitral awards on merits, but it's not a simple today's conversation. However, it's easier way to get an award first and then to present the award in the next stage of insolvency. If the case is quite complicated, if it's a simple claim under Russian law with uh, quite solid uh, material evidence uh, on this case, then it might be easier just to present it in an insolvency case. Another factor affecting this uh, choice uh, is the uh, probability of termination of the insolvency case uh, in the very first stage. For example, it might be a settlement agreement within the insolvency case with other creditors, or it might uh, be withdrawal of the uh, initial claim of the first creditors insolvency case or other reasons why the insolvency case in Russia could be terminated. And if you have an information that it is quite probable, then maybe it's not reasonable to suspend or terminate arbitration proceedings because in such a case, if you terminate it or suspend it, you will find yourself within a year or half of a year uh, without an insolvency case because it was terminated and without an award because you have skipped your arbitration proceedings, which is quite a pity situation. Sorry, uh, uh, yeah. can, I, can, I, can I just ask a question about the supervision yeah. stage? Um, so at this stage, has uh, the Russian court appointed a supervisor? And, um, yeah. and then what, what, what role do the directors continue to have? Are they, are they continue, do they continue to have power to, to defend um, a bankruptcy? Yes, of course. Previous management of the debtor, I mean management appointed by the shareholders of the debtor, still have their authorities and their powers, and they could uh, represent uh, the company, the debtor, in relation with other parties. However, the, I will say, uh, supervision receiver, let's, uh, let's use this term, uh, have a right to Challenge particular transaction. Uh, he is uh, going to collect information about ongoing and previous business activities of the company, and he has a right and a duty to get a decision on approval of a particular transaction uh, which have to be made by the debtor. For example, uh, if a uh, uh, CEO is going to make a transaction on sale of the male asset of the company, then he will get not only approval of the shareholders meeting, that also uh, he had to get an approval uh, by the interim receivership, I mean, uh, supervision receivership manager. Otherwise, it will be a ground for challenge of the transaction. But generally, yes, generally the debtor is represented by his former management at this stage. However, if we are go talking about the receivership, the next stage, then in such a case, uh, authorities of the previous management uh, are terminated, and uh, the receiver will get the whole power of uh, the managing body of the company, and he will represent the company in relation to the other parties. And then, if if it's in receivership, so on the, on your second stage, which, which I think you were coming to, um, would would the receiver normally continue in arbitration, or would would he say um, the company's getting sued? Um, I I think we ought to settle the claim, or or whatever. What, what how would how would that work? Yeah, you know, would, would it automatically would it automatically terminate the arbitration or? No, of course it will be not uh, any automatic termination of arbitration because an arbitral uh, tribunal will have a choice whether uh, it's ready to continue with arbitration. But from the prospect of Russian law, uh, of course uh, the arbitration proceedings should be terminated due to the next stage in receivership, and the Russian receiver, uh, of course, he will uh, just. Uh, uh, use the Russian law position in this respect uh, as a representative of the debt. And he will say in the arbitration proceedings that yes, now those proceedings should be terminated. And usually it raises uh, uh, some place for a dispute between a claimant and respondent in the arbitration procedure whether uh, limitations of Russian insolvency law uh, is a ground to actually terminate or suspend the proceedings or it's, uh, it's possible to continue 
this arbitration procedure. But from the prospect of Russian law, of course, it's just a ground to terminate those proceedings. And moreover, any assets uh, which uh, will be recovered by the claimant uh, on the basis of the award, uh, which are obtained in such proceedings, would be considered from the prospect of Russian law uh, as then a kind of unjust uh, enrichment. And uh, there are two, actually, there are two types of qualification of such payments in Russian law practice. The first one is the preferential transaction, preferential payment, and the second one is the unjust enrichment. And in such a case, such payment may be challenged uh, within the scope of Russian insolvency case, and if the claimant creditors were quite active to get an asset abroad, then still uh, we risk that uh, other creditors or the receivers uh, would challenge such transaction and trying to get the money recovered by the, from the claimant to the bankruptcy asset in the uh, Russian insolvency case. Because there are some specific schemes of avoiding such risk, including assignment of claims, etc., etc. But uh, generally, I would just point that such risk exists and it's a big problem. Sometimes, in our experience, uh, arbitral tribunals raised this issue on the basis of the defendant's arguments in this respect. And actually, claimant could argue that if in the future he recover some money from the debtor on the basis of this award, then the claimant promise to the arbitral tribunal uh, or to the foreign state court just to transfer those money recovered from the debtor asset to the bank of CSA. It's a quite uh, interesting construction because actually we're talking about uh, you know, just a promise to the arbitral tribunal or a foreign court, but uh, usually it helps uh, to continue arbitration and uh, of course if in the future uh, the creditor fails to fulfill such obligations, then it might uh, rise uh, uh, civil and criminal liabilities for the claimant and uh, his representatives as well. So it's quite you know, a complex issue. Uh, that, that's, that's also a sort of a, a useful counterpoint to um, the, the sort of the common law approach, because the, the common law approach, I, I think receivership probably would be equivalent to the appointment of a liquidator. So when you wind up a company, a liquidator is appointed. Um, and then certainly under um, English law and uh, BVI law, uh, and I think Hong Kong and Singapore, you, you, you have then the benefit of a moratorium, which essentially means that um, uh, uh, no party can continue proceedings against the company unless it gets the court's permission. Um, now, there are, there are some occasions where the court will grant permission to, to continue a case against a company that has been liquidated, um, but they're, they're, they're usually quite specific um, factual cases. So, for example, if you've ob obtained um, an award on liability in arbitration, uh, and then the um, uh, the defendant, uh, the respondent to the arbitration, uh, is uh, is wound up, um, and you you wish to crystallise or at least have a, a, an award on quantum, in order to to know what is the amount that you want you 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 have to put in for your proof of debt into the estate, then then potentially the court could uh, grant permission uh, to to continue the arbitration. But, um, but it's quite a difficult exercise because obviously at the stage um, a liquidator is appointed, although the directors remain in office, they have no powers to deal with the affairs of the company. Um, and so the issue then becomes, well, who, who, is, going to fund, who is going to fund the arbitration to defend it? Um, uh, and that becomes one of the issues as to, as to you know, what is the purpose in continuing with uh, uh, an arbitration or continuing claims against a company that's been liquidated if, if in fact, um, one, they, they're going to be undefended and, and in any event, um, you're simply going to put in your proof of debt into the bankruptcy estate. Um, so I think that's probably one difference with the, with the common law jurisdiction. Yeah, to be clear, there is a similar moratorium in Russia and under Russian law. Of course, Russian law doesn't allow to continue with arbitration during the receivership uh, stage. And it just seems that there is no supervision stage or an analogy of uh, supervision stage in a common law jurisdiction. But if we're talking about a, a, a real insolvency, which is a uh, receivership stage in Russia and the winding up uh, common law jurisdiction, then in such a case, of course, our jurisdiction have uh, quite uh, direct law provision prohibiting um, uh, any uh, 
recovery outcome of the bankruptcy. But we are talking about practice, and in practice, usually foreign courts and uh, foreign arbitral uh, awards, uh, arbitral tribunals, allows to continue such arbitration. And uh, there is also a quite interesting discussion about nature of the limitation of Russian insolvency law, because there is a position which was, for example, admitted by the High Court uh, in uh, several cases connected with Russian uh, oligarchs, that insolvency provisions of Russian law, uh, uh, those of them uh, which have a you know, material substance, uh, which uh, uh, construed, uh, for example, grounds for liability, etc., etc., they do have an extraterritorial effect. So they do have an effect which might be implied uh, outside of Russia. While those provisions of Russian law, uh, which have a procedural nature, for example, particular limitation on filing of the claims and petition to particular bodies, terms, and etc., 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 and such a procedural provisions of Russian law do not have an extraterritorial effect, and they should be applied within the territory of Russia only. And uh, on the basis of uh, this distinction, there is a quite good position that uh, limitations of Russian insolvency law on filing claims outside of the Russian bankruptcy case are not applicable outside of Russia. And on the basis of this uh, concept, uh, quite usual, because usually uh, foreign courts and arbitral tribunals uh, continue to consider claims against Russian debtors, including uh, claims in arbitration proceedings, uh, with respect to procedural nature of limitation to present such, such claims in Russia. Of course, there is a very uh, big field for discussion because you must say that uh, actually moratorium is a nature of insolvency. So what, what is the reason to uh, start insolvency proceedings if, you, if creditors do not benefit from the moratorium against all the claims? However, uh, there, are, there is no unified approach uh, in Russia and uh, outside. So it's just a field for, for battles. And, the, and I think so, uh, moratorium is also working in, even at the supervision stage because you cannot enforce your, your reward. So uh, even if you obtain it uh, just before initiation of the supervision, but, you, uh, but the supervision is initiated, so you could just recognize it uh, in the course of bankruptcy and include your claims into, into the register just because after initiation of supervision, all enforcement proceedings should be, should be stopped, should be terminated. Yes, that's why the main question is whether you're going to enforce your award in Russia. Because if you don't want, then you could just you know, ignore Russian proceedings and just to be prepared to present relevant arguments to the arbitral tribunal and to get a final award and to enforce it outside of Russia. And there is respect to the timing, I think we should go to the next slide uh, just to end my part of our discussion. Thank you. Uh, so another interesting question uh, is uh, uh, opportunities for settlement with a debtor who is under insolvency proceedings. I'm talking about settlement and arbitration proceedings. Well, yes, the debtor is under insolvency in Russia. So. Uh, in addition uh, to uh, standard, um, you know, requirements for such settlements, there are some uh, particular specific requirements prescribed by the insolvency law in Russia. Uh, so first of all, of course, um, uh, you should get uh, uh, or be sure that the debtor provides the arbitral tribunal with the uh, corporate decision on approval of the transaction. I'm talking first of all about the main transaction and the interested party transaction. Uh, and if we're talking about supervision provisions, then such approvals should be provided by the just general meeting of shareholders because they still have their rights and they still vote on this issue. But if we are talking about the receivership procedure where the you know, permanent receiver uh, was appointed then such approval should be provided not by the uh, general meeting of shareholders. No, such approval should be provided uh, by the general creditors meeting. So in such a case, the creditors will decide whether they are uh, ready to allow the debtor uh, represented by the receiver to uh, make a relevant transaction. And from the prospect of Russian law, uh, settlement agreement and arbitration is clearly a kind of a deal or transaction which should be uh, approved by the creditors. The interesting question is uh, 
whether other uh, deals and other transactions which are not mayor or interested party should be uh, approved by the creditors meeting because there is no direct Russian law provision for provision uh, applying uh, receiver to get such an approval for every deal uh, but uh, it still be a risk that such a deal will be challenged by other creditors if as a receiver would fail uh, to, to get such approval. So to be on a safe side for any settlement and arbitration proceeding with the Russian debtor, it should be uh, obtained uh, relevant uh, permission by the creditors' uh, meetings of the debtor in Russia. Uh, it's, it's strongly mandatory to do it with interested party and money transaction, and it's highly recommended to do it uh, in, relation, in respect to uh, each as a settlement. However, it's a you know, arguable field just to discuss whether it's really necessary for the rest of transaction. And if you go back to the supervision, provision, uh, supervision procedure whether, uh, where the receiver uh, is not uh, management of the company but just you know, supervision body, in such a case you also should uh, get uh, an approval by the uh, supervision receiver to make a particular transaction mm -hmm. and uh, there are, uh, just presented on the slide, there are particular types of transactions which should be approved by the receiver and you should know that in a particular cases the Russian court uh, might make a wider list of the transactions which should be approved by the receiver so it should be carefully checked prior to settlement with such a party. The next slide, please. Can I, can I, sorry, just going back to the previous yeah. slide, um, please. Yeah. Um, um, uh, it, it, so, so in your, your um, receivership side, you say the supervision receiver acts on behalf of the debtor as a party to the transaction. So this, this is a scenario where you have uh, a, a, a solvent um, claimant um, yes, for example, yes. In arbitration, and, and then you have a, an insolvent um, respondent to the arbitration. So what, what, what happens if, it's, if, the, if, the, if they reach a settlement, what effect will that have? Is, is, it, is it possible for the supervising receiver to pay the, the, the award, the, the settlement amount that they agree on? Or, or, uh, and then how does that affect other creditors? Let's say if we're talking about the receivership stage, then in such a case, the Russian receiver wouldn't uh, uh, conclude any settlement in arbitration because it would be just a direct road to get a liability under Russian law for such a receiver. Yeah. So right. we're talking about about situation when the claimant is uh, a bankrupt or insolvent company under Russian law and the receiver uh, acting on behalf of the claimant in arbitration proceedings for one side and the respondent in this proceedings is, for example, solvent company. So uh, in such a case, uh, yes, the receiver could make a transaction with other party, but uh, transaction, I mean, a settlement agreement, but such settlement agreement should be approved uh, by the creditors meeting. So uh, it's theoretically, theoretically, I could imagine a situation when the uh, receiver would conclude uh, uh, the agreement from the respondent side and the uh, respondent is a debtor in Russian insolvency case and potentially arbitral tribunal might uh, approve such agreement, but it would uh, lead to a huge risk of uh, responsibility for the receiver and the risk of challenging of uh, such a uh, an agreement as a transaction in Russian insolvency case just due to moratorium introduced uh, in relation to the debtor. And uh, of course, it will be extremely uh, hard to make a payment uh, under such settlement from the debtor who is under insolvency. Uh, it actually, it might lead to criminal liability of the receiver. So I will uh, recommend to skip such an option. So let's go to the next slide. Thank you. And uh, the last uh, theme, I uh, just want to uh, uh, I, say honestly, I do not have a direct and uh, clear answer to the question which I'm going to raise, but I will be happy to discuss it with you guys. So, if we're talking about the settlement and arbitration and relevant limitation of the Russian insolvency case, then to which particular types of settlement uh, such limitations are applicable. So it's quite uh, clear that in relation to a pure settlement agreement, 
I mean, settlement is approved by the arbitral tribunal when the respective award is issued. It's quite clear that such a settlement will be treated as a deal and uh, all the limitation and restriction are uh, so clearly will be applied. But what if we're talking about agreement on facts? I mean, agreement when the parties agree that the steps particular facts to place, but they do not uh, uh, have any agreement on a particular payments in this case. And they are not going to just settle the case as a final settlement, but they have just uh, discussed the particular facts actually to place and agreed on it. Should rules or the approval of uh, transactions be applied in such a case or not? Another question is uh, what about uh, the claimant who waives the part of his claim in uh, the arbitration proceeding, such waiver of the claim. Is it a transaction for purpose uh, of uh, approval under Russian insolvency law? From other side, if uh, the debtor uh, confess a claim in the part, uh, is, is it a transaction under the Russian law? And this is a very big question because uh, actually I think that all of us could uh, find a quite good reasons for any approach in this respect. We could argue that, of course, waiver and confession is a deal and a material fact for the purpose of the Russian insolvency law because it leads to alteration of obligation. Uh, from other side, you could say that, no, actually, waiver and confession do not change the nature of obligation because the material substance of such obligation took place earlier and it already exists. And the fact that the party just uh, just recognized and admitted that it has a right or has not a right, it's not a change of the right itself and it's not a deal. So I just uh, want to point out that it might be a quite interesting field for battle if we are talking about necessity of approvals of the uh, receivers or the creditors of the uh, debtor in relation to such activities. So guys, do you have any idea in this respect? Should such uh, types of settlement be approved by the receivers or, cre or creditors or should not? I think practically speaking, uh, it matters uh, when this settlement agreement is further used in the course of bankruptcy. Uh, and uh, it could be, on the, uh, if it happens, uh, then it could be, it could be challenged uh, by, by, by the creators. Because uh, my question was, is, is, it, is it not just mind games? I mean, uh, practically speaking, how often uh, such, uh, such situation uh, uh, could, could occur? I mean, uh, not, not your settlement agreement, but agreement of facts or some, some conf confessions. Let's imagine that we do have an affiliated creditor with a debtor, and they do have an ongoing arbitration proceedings, and they, they are actually controlled by the same same people by the same beneficiaries, which is, of course, is not quite clear for the third parties. And there is a kind of settlement uh, between them. Uh, it's quite easy to struggle with it if we, they do have a few settlements and they just agreed on something and it was approved by the arbitrator. But what if they have presented the case in such uh, such way that the tribunal just he, he didn't have another way than just to admit the claim? But it wasn't a, you know, a direct confession, but it was a type of uh, such, you know, actoring and, uh, by the defendant and uh, the claimant and precedence, which leads to a particular law. So actually in Russian court practice, if we, let's, let's forget about arbitration. Yes, okay, if we're talking about just a litigation and a litigation and a separate proceedings uh, prior to the arbitration, and it will be proved that it was an informal agreement between the claimant and the debtor, and it was a related person, that is quite clear that you will just uh, appeal the such a ju Russian court judgment in the previous case, and then you will uh, just get out this uh, creditor from the registry. But what if we are talking about an arbitration, and what if we are talking about a situation when such you know, recognition or confession uh, or waiver of the claim wasn't so clear for, for everyone? In such a case, uh, it might be quite difficult to show that it's a, you know, a shame, shame transaction or a shame proceedings. In such a case, you should refer to the uh, rules on approval of the transaction. But it's quite disputable from the Russian law uh, prospects 
whether such particular mm, steps in arbitration proceedings have to be approved as a transactions or it's just you know uh, procedural steps of a uh, representative which is not a deal by its nature so it's quite an interesting question Maybe somebody in the panel, uh, I mean, our visitors, do have any idea in this respect? I see that Anton Alifanov is here. I see that. Just, just give me a second. Alexander Shavalip is here and other guys. Okay, I propose to, to, to speak it uh, to speak about it uh, after after this session, because we, we unfortunately have only uh, 10, 10 minutes left. Ten minutes left, yeah. Yeah, we have some some other topics to, to discuss. Do you want to go into your next slide? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So the other situation uh, which I want to cover is the bankruptcy of the of the plaintiff, and in my view, this situation is even more interesting. Uh, as I as I uh, as I previously said. Uh, there was a quite interesting case of the Supreme Court, uh, which was, uh, I would say, expected uh, by by the community. I mean, I mean, uh, legal conclusions of the Supreme Court in this case. Uh, so, this in this case, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of enforceability of uh, arbitration clauses, uh, but used uh, some some arguments uh, in, in, when substantiating this decision. Uh, which could be uh, further applied uh, by by claimants who are in who are in bankruptcy in order to to litigate, not to to arbitrate and to go to 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 the uh, to the Russian uh, state court. Um, so uh, br briefly speaking about uh, about this this case, uh, it was honestly not not uh, the 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 case related to bankruptcy. So the claimant in this case was not in bankruptcy, but uh, the main argument of the claimant, which skipped uh, arbitration and uh, didn't manage to pay two thousand euro uh, to initiate uh, arbitration proceedings before a Stockholm uh, tribunal, the main the main argument was that claimant did not have enough money to pursue these arbitration proceedings, and that that is why. Uh, the claimant wants to initiate litigation uh, proceedings before uh, before Russian before Russian court. So uh, the court of first instance uh, um, ruled in favor uh, in favor of the defendant and left the claim without consideration. This uh, this ruling was uh, uh, was set aside by the appeal court, uh, but then Cassation appeal court uh, up, upheld uh, the first instance court and Supreme Court finally. Uh, uh, finally, uh, supported position of the first, first instance court. But a uh, bitter dictum, uh, the Supreme Court said that in this specific case, it was not proved that uh, the claimant did not have enough money to initiate and pursue the arbitration proceedings. But uh, the Supreme Court said that there could be potentially some cases, for example, bankruptcy of the claimant, uh, which could give an opportunity for, for the claimant to uh, initiate uh, litigation proceedings and skip the arbitration clause. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, after this, after this, uh, after this case of the Supreme Court in 2017, to be honest, the uh, the, the case law in, in Russia re remained the same, and uh, uh, the proportion of uh, uh, when the uh, when the Russian courts they uh, they uh, leave such such claims without consideration, and they say that it should uh, go under the arbitration clause is uh, is about seventy percent and thirty uh, percent they are against and they say that uh, if the claimant uh, manages to prove that uh, he doesn't have enough money, so it could go to it could go to the to the Russian state court so here on this slide, you see the main arguments which are usually used by uh, claimants and uh, defendants, vice versa, uh, when they, they try to prove that uh, the arbitration clause is enforceable and you should go under the arbitration clause, or uh, uh, when you are, trying, you are trying to substantiate that, you, you, you could go to, to, to the 
uh, to the Russian state court. So can, uh, I, can I ask a question about that, Sergei? Yeah. So, so in this scenario, you have um, the claimant company is bankrupt. Yes. Presumably, it has uh, trade creditors that that are causing yes. Yes. The, the bankruptcy. Is, is it possible for the trade creditors to fund? For it. So, so for example, in the common law, it's, it is quite often that you'll have a petitioning creditor who appoints the liquidator via a winding up petition. Mm -hmm. And then there are actions that the petitioning creditor wants the, um, the liquidator to, to do. So there may be claims that the company has against third parties. And so the petitioning creditor will fund the liquidator in order to bring the claims in the name of the insolvent company. Mm -hmm. So in, in this case, this, this doesn't seem to take into account any, fun, any form of funding from third parties. Uh, so in Russia, the situation, in my experience, is, uh, is quite different because in many cases, that is the, arg the argument of the respondent who wants uh, to have arbitration proceedings and who is uh, ready to finance uh, arbitration proceedings. So I've seen a lot of cases when the respondent... Uh, uh, Usually, when, when the, the case goes into Russian state court, when the respondent says that uh, you did not initiate arbitration proceedings, uh, but if you uh, did do it, uh, I will finance uh, your, uh, your, your proceedings. And sometimes they even provide right. some evidence that they, for example, paid some money to the, uh, to the arbitration institution in order, uh, in order, to, uh, in order that uh, the claimant could uh, pursue the arbitration proceedings. So in, in most cases, in my experience, the creators of the debtor, they are not interested in uh, pursuing arbitration proceedings just because uh, in Russia, uh, litigation proceedings, they're faster, they are simpler, they are, they are cheaper. So uh, it, it, it is in favor of the creators of the debtor. Uh, to uh, to pursue litigation proceedings in the Russian state court, not not uh, uh, not uh, not uh, arbitration proceedings. Nikolai, you are, you are, you are muted. I will say just about one exception from that rule. When we are talking about the uh, respondent, uh, the, debt, the debtor of the debtor, uh, if such the debtor of the debtor is located, uh, located outside of Russia, then in such a case, it might be not so you know, beneficial to get a Russian state court judgment in this respect because it might be some tricky issues with recognition of such a judgment. And in such a case, it might be quite beneficial for the creditors of the debtor to get an award against the the Russian debtor of the debtor. And in such a case, uh, the generally there are two types of, of financing. The first of all, for the bankruptcy estate, and uh, usually Russian receivers just, you know, uh, they appoint a uh, creditor's meeting to get an approval of the creditors who spent money in such a uh, crazy way. And uh, the second uh, option uh, is, uh, you know, just to get um, some financing from the creditors. So you, usually major creditors of the debtor who are interested to proceed with such an arbitration proceedings. But unfortunately, there is no really good and clear procedure of financing of the receiver by such creditors within the scope of the insolvency proceedings. And sometimes it may lead to some uh, payments in favor of the receiver, uh, some you know, debts uh, uh, between the creditors and the receiver, which are not shown to anybody, and especially to the court. Uh, and uh, it, it, this is a way uh, how the receiver collect money to start such proceeding. And then if uh, uh, they, you know, just was quite successful in arbitration and get an actual recovery, then sometimes receivers just look back to such money to the creditor, but sometimes they could say, hey, I don't have any idea about what money is saying to me. Just get your piece from the receivership estate and fuck off. So uh, actually it's a kind of uh, uh, tricky, tricky uh, question that you raised at the moment. And uh, uh, unfortunately Russian law is not really adaptive to such a kind of an issue. Yes. Okay. We've, we've, we've reached the limit of our talk. Should we, should we see if there's any questions? Um, and do you want to do your final section, Sergei? Uh, yeah, I can do it briefly. I think one, two minutes will be enough. So coming back to the bankruptcy of the, uh, the, the, defen of the defendant, defendant or the respondent, I just want to share experience uh, uh, or one, uh, uh, one case in which I uh, took part uh, last year. 
So uh, that was the bankruptcy of the Russian company, and uh, the claimant was the the European the European company. So the the amount of claims was very huge, like several hundred, several hundreds of, of, of euro. And in this specific case, the proceedings were initiated before introduction of supervision of the Russian debtor company. Uh, and the uh, main idea in this case was to obtain an award as soon as possible, just because the supervision in Russia usually lasts uh, seven months, so it could, it could last longer. But uh, in most cases, uh, seven, uh, seven months or about. And uh, in this specific case, uh, our client, who was the claimant, uh, asked about partial final award uh, in respect of the main, uh, main amount of uh, uh, claim. Uh, and uh, this uh, partial final award uh, was uh, provided to, 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 to our client. And, the arbitral tribunal consisted of three QCs. They managed to, uh, uh, to provide an award uh, uh, two weeks after, uh, after uh, the, hearing, uh, the hearings completed. Uh, just like uh, one week before introduction of the uh, receivership procedures, so before declaring the debtor, uh, debtor ban bankrupt. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to say some, uh, some words about the case law in Russia. So it, it, the, the case law is different. And here you, you see uh, two cases with different uh, conclusions. So on, in the Erka case, the Russian court said that you cannot uh, recognize uh, partial, partial award. But a silver, silver burn case is, uh, is in favor of uh, partial, partial final awards. Which you know is which you know are provided by uh, by several uh, by 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 various rules of arbitration institutions, European arbitration institutions. And in this specific case, the the court said that as in the final partial in the final partial award, the case may be in part but is uh, uh, finally resolved by the arbitral tribunal. So it means that uh, partial final award could be recognized uh, by, uh, by, by, Russian, by Russian state court. Uh, and uh, I, 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 pro I used this, uh, so I provided the, 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 this slide uh, to, to bear in mind that, this, that, that there is a such, 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 such remedy as partial final award, because in many situations where you have bankruptcy, you should, be, you should be in a hurry, you should be quick and to obtain an award as soon as possible. And this, uh, this uh, instrument, uh, which is provided by, by rules of ar ar arbitration institutions, is, is very good when you, you need to, to have a, a final but partial award and use it further uh, in the course of, uh, in the course of uh, bankruptcy. Uh, in this case of the, of the bankruptcy of the Russian, uh, of the Russian bank company. I will just add that it might be an interesting question of the nature of recognition of such a word by the court, because there are mainly two options. Yeah, the first one is just recognition and make a, a binding effect uh, of the award, like, you know, just a court judgment. And another approach and possible option is just to consider such an award as one of evidence of, uh, the, of an obligation. So in such a case, it's not a formal uh, recognition and binding effect of the award in insolvency. Still, it might be considered by the Russian state court as an evidence in relation to obligation, which might be quite uh, useful as well, even if uh, we fail, for example, to recognize it's uh, like a binding award. So it's still be an option to use it in Russia. Yes. Yeah, and then under common law, you might be able to get recognition of the award um, uh, but but then essentially you'd you'd have to put that in and as as part of the proof of debt you'd 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 use your award and then you 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 would stand uh, you don't get any any security as a result of your um, your award so you'd you'd, you'd be pari passive with other creditors uh, in the um, in the bankruptcy estate. Um, right, we've got a few minutes. Any, there, there, I think there is one question. Let's have a look. Can you discuss briefly the matter of public policy as a limitation? <laughs> to enforce an arbitral award that relates to insolvency. <laughs> this question just couldn't be discussed briefly because, uh, unfortunately, there is a lot of Russian uh, case law, quite usually embarrassing case law, uh, saying us that from the prospect of Russian state courts, uh, awards uh, 
just just nothing. It's not an evidence. It's not uh, a binding act. It's just a, a piece of paper which should be considered uh, as just a, a sign that the claim maybe it exists, maybe not. And then Russian courts usually just tend to uh, reconsider cases on merits, while it's clearly should be left in uh, such a case. And uh, uh, the most uh, the most bulk of Russian Supreme Court practice uh, considering issue of a public policy in relation to the world uh, is connected with the question whether arbitration proceedings actually took place, whether uh, parties actually filed the submissions to the arbitral tribunal, and whether arbitrators actually considered those evidence, and whether uh, those evidence uh, was provided. So the main tricky issue is to, to have a bundle of the evidence that yes actually the arbitral proceedings took place and the award is not some and only evidence that they took place sometimes in, due, uh, due to this reason for example we are asking the arbitral tribunals to allow us to for audio recording of the hearings because it's Usually it's an issue because of the reality of the proceeding, but if as a party uh, didn't object it, uh, usually a bit of table allows. This is making just in order to show the Russian state court in the future that yes, arbitration proceedings actually took place, the position of the party actually was presented, and etc. etc. So uh, I would say that Russian domestic pocket arbitration has uh, just. Uh, diminished uh, the value of the arbitral awards for the Russian state court in such a strong way that uh, foreign arbitral awards by the respectful institutions also uh, considers by the Russian state court on the same standards. And uh, the public policy is the main, you know, weapon against the wars in Russia. But equally, I mean, if you have, suppose, suppose you do have, uh, you've successfully had a, a long, hard fought arbitration, you've achieved a award, and then as the award is published, the defendant company against whom you've got the award is declared insolvent. Um, how, how can that be enforced um, without prejudicing other creditors? Um, uh, I mean, there sometimes is a, is a race to get your award recognized. Um, but, but, but if the party has successfully filed for liquidation or has been wound up, how do you manage to enforce uh, the, the, the award? I think we are talking about you know the burden of proof and the burden of proof for to be presented by other creditors to show that this award is not uh, uh, consistent with the law. Or mm. the but even if you even if you get to the stage where you establish that the arbitration took place, it was all valid, etc. In under Russian law, how 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 would you then enforce it? Because if there's a payment out, wouldn't that prejudice other creditors to the to the to the insolvent company? We are talking about enforcement in such a case, not as an enforcement uh, separate to the insolvency proceedings. I believe that Sergei talked about uh, enforcement in in the insolvency proceedings. So when right. oh, no, I, I thought the question was about um, about public policy, the limitation to enforce ah, the so arbitral award that relates to insolvency. I thought if the is the, is the question. Uh, was considering situation when the award is enforcing out scope of the insolvency proceedings, then there is actually no chance to, to do it. And the, the basic uh, uh, argument against it is not a public policy, just a direct restriction by the Russian insolvency law. But if we're talking about the recognition within the scope of insolvency case, then the public policy argument to, uh, just go to the front uh, of uh, the battlefield and then we discuss this issue. So. Any, anybody want to ask a live question? We've, we've, we've gone about 10 minutes over our time, but I'm, I'm sure we're ha happy to take any questions if anybody wants to um, um, put their hand up. Well, I, th I think. Just, just thank you. <laughs> it's more than enough. Yes, it's more than enough. Yes. Well, thank, 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 thank you both uh, for a very entertaining um, uh, session, and um, hopefully um, see you both next year in in Moscow. Uh, thank see you, you guys. Thank you. Thank you.
Peter, Sergey, have a nice day. Thank you very much. I think bye I think bye. our session is the last one, so I hope I hope everybody enjoy enjoyed the conference. So see see you see you next year next year. See you next year. Yes, yeah. so hopefully live in see Moscow. You. See you live. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.